So um, unfortunately, uh, Professor Aletras is uh, sick today, so I will uh, cover up for him in, in this lecture. Um, so um, artifi arti artificial in intelligence uh, is a very, very broad um, term. It was coined in the 1950s, and um, since then, a lot of sub sub entities in, in this has emerged. So uh, machine learning came 1970 something, um, and then artificial neural networks in the 90s, and deep learning in 2010. So I will here in this lecture go into a bit more on which, what they actually are and what they stand for and uh, how to understand them, these concepts. But I think, because I think it's important to distinguish between the concepts while you're talking. So what is artificial intelligence? So um, it's a theory and development of computer systems that have the capability to perform uh, tasks that would normally require human intervention and intelligence. So, for instance, perception, vision, voice, voice recognition, decision making, translation between languages uh, would be sort of concepts that could go into artificial intelligence. So, basically, systems that behave intelligent in some way. Um, so, artificial intelligence is a scientific field that studies smart agents. So there are machines that can perceive their environment and act, so maximize the probability of obtaining the goal. So automated systems. Uh, one of the front figures in artificial intelligence uh, was John McCarthy. Um, and in 1956, he defined it like this. And I think it's a definition that still is very relevant today. So t artificial intelligence is machine that performs tasks that are char characteristic of human intelligence. And then what is characteristic of human intelligence is something that's a wide bit that we can discuss, but it's at least the foundation. So artificial, artificial intelligence is, is, is the wider scope. And then it's, we can narrow it down a bit more to machine learning. So machine learning is the study of algorithms and statistical models uh, used by computer systems in order to complete a task, for instance, pattern recognition. So machine learning do not need specific instructions for completing the task. They do not need specific programming by a programmer to set up rules. So basically machine learning is about how to learn from data. Um, so uh, this was defined as in, by Arthur Samuels, another um, founder of the field, so to speak. So he first was um, uh, writing software to play checker, for instance. So he defined it as the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Uh, another definition that actually one of my favorites is from Tom Mitchell, another founder in the field, and on this slide he's teaching. So he defined it like this. So a computer program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P if its performance of tasks in T as measured by P improves with experience of E. So the central thing here uh, is actually to really go in to define, okay, what do we mean with experience? What do we mean with task? And what do we do mean with um, performance? So all of these needs to be quantified, otherwise we cannot really talk about machine learning. One of the things that mo many people today is not recognize is uh, actually the T. What is the task? And what is the domain you're supposed to, to solve in? So if you want to make a machine learning for dri self-driving car, the task is very complex because there can be lots of things on the road that you need to Anticipate, anticipate. Okay, so we can narrow it down slightly even more <clears throat> to artificial neural networks. So artificial neural networks are computer systems with the characteristics that are mimicking in some way the human uh, central nervous system and human brain. So there are uh, systems that are in, that have interconnected groups of nodes 
that can be seen as a simple version of the neurons in the brain. And one interconnection represents an artificial neuron, neuron. So here in the image, we have input neurons in red to the left, uh, and then a hidden layer of uh, uh, neurons and an output layer. And they are all interconnected. Uh, and then about 2010, uh, a new thing emerged was still artificial neural networks, but now people made them, starting to make them deeper, so have many more hidden layers. Uh, this example shows only three hidden layers um, that would typically not qualify as deep, uh, a deep network today. Maybe there are 20, 40, 100 layers. Um, so exactly where, where is the cutoff of being deep is really a matter of taste, but deep needs to be a bit, bit, bit deeper than uh, this. Um, because uh, what researchers found was that uh, adding more layers actually really imp improved the performance. Uh, and also, if you look at what happens in the layers, that the early layers seem to um, extract, uh, for instance, edges in images and or characters or so. So it's, uh, it seems like they're, they're structuring it a, a bit, and it's an effective way of solving things. So let's. So this was the basic concepts of um, uh, artificial intelligence, and then machine learning. Uh, artificial neural networks, and then deep learning. So let's look at some examples of neural networks. So here's an example. We want to, in the image, we want to classify pixels in the myocardium. So you, oh, no, I cannot. Um, anyway, so the, see one part of the myocardium is brighter, and one part is uh, more dark. And in the middle of the left is the ventricle. So we want to classify edematous, which is the, the brighter part of the, of the um, myocardium. Well, maybe here. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So this is the, uh, the edematous, and this is the normal myocardium. So we can con construct a simple input layer, and then an, a normal, this act, normal node that activates. This is normal, and this is edematous, and then we we'll look at the output of these neuro, neuro, neurons to see. Then we can make it uh, a bit deep. So uh, for each for each of the pixels in the image, we have the input to one, one layer here, and there are a lot of hidden layers to connect them. And then we see if there's an edema or a normal uh, output. So how does it work? So if we look at one neuron here. Uh, this has a lot of weights from different other neurons. So for each of these connections, uh, there's a weight on how, how important is this connection. So basically, it takes the other layers, multiply it with a constant, uh, and then it sums, and then creates an output. Uh, sometimes this output is also um, passing through a nonlinear function. So really, it's quite simple uh, network structures but yet they are actually able to learn um, really impressive uh, features. Um, then we have something that we call uh, convolutional neural networks. So uh, if I can go, mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, go back one slide. Um, the, uh, here, the network was fully connected, so all all layers, all nodes were talking to all other nodes. But in the con convolutional neural networks, they basically only talk with neighbors, and they share a lot of weights. So uh, this makes them really good for image processing uh, and, and um, much more faster to learn. And then they're not fully connected. So a bit on how, how the networks are, are training. So. Uh, again, the, the, this example. Um, so we basically you start with a network that it's just the weights are just randomly assigned, and then you you compute based on your input 
and then get an output. And then you check, is, was my output correct or not? Uh, so if it was correct, uh, it was feed the backward, or this was a good behavior, uh, and the weights are, are adjusted to even further enhance that it was a miss. If it was not, uh, the, the weights were changed in a different direction to uh, enhance that uh, this was a bad behavior, basically. And then you repeat this a lot, a lot of times. And then, so maybe you have, in the network, you may, may have, have hundreds of thousands of uh, weights that you need to adjust. So this, you're actually solving a uh, really big optimization problem uh, with hundreds of thousands of unknowns in, in the network, um, and then feeding with back propagation um, um, based on gradients on the, on the performance on the network. So the process is repeated. So, and what's really driving this, and what was also the cause of the, the big explosion of uh, the interest of neural networks uh, and the deep learning in 2010, was uh, graphic uh, in GPUs, graphic cards. So this was driven by the video games at that time. Uh, so suddenly the, the graphic cards were really suited for, for doing um, this kind of training. And it was possible to make the, the, the networks much deeper. Nowadays, uh, basically a lot of the, the um, uh, graphics card is not driven by video games anymore, but it's really for, for just um, uh, deep learning. So again, basically have no rules, no programming, a lot of data needed. Uh, typically you have, if you have, if you take all your data you have, typically you divide it so that maybe you have 60% uh, you use for training, uh, and then 20% you use for validation, and then 20% you use for test. Uh, there's a really important distinguish between test and validation data sets. So the validation data set you use for uh, during training, during selecting models. Um, so uh, you work with your validation training going back and forth, but you never touch the test data set, and then after some months when you really place with your models, then you take out the test data set to really see how does it behaves on the test data set. That, that otherwise you optimize your, your selection of your models because often you retrain the network, changing some parameters, and then maybe you just get lucky uh, in one training set and on your validation data, but then you sort of have your test data to really, really see that. <clears throat> So when reading papers in this field, it's really important to really look at how did they separate the test data and validation data. Um, so here's an example uh, for machine learning example that we have done in Lund. So this is one of the gradient, uh, uh, gradient PC students. Um, so in this case, let's uh, see if we can explain it. So, <clears throat> um, we use uh, machine learning to make MR reconstructions. So uh, the images, uh, we, we can acquire the images in the radial, um, radial Fourier domain. So we take, instead of um, Cartesian sample of the image like this, you take a radial spokes in the Fourier domain. Uh, and if there are any imperfections in the um, MRI scanner hardware, um, it's, you, you get images that are, looks really, re really poor. But you can train a network to go from poor images to nice images because it learned how to interpret these kind of very weird looking artifacts and reconstruct them. Uh, and also here we have uh, thrown away a lot of data because we want to acquire the data much faster. So here is only one tenth of the data set, and it's really hard to, to see what it is. And then we feed this to the network, and then it spits out this based on the machine learning. And here we can see it really has hallucinates a lot of things because this the septum here between the ventricles is really straight. Here, one fifth of the data. Now it's actually start to, to perform because if you check with this compared to ground truth, it's not that bad after all, especially given that it was given this input. 
and one half of the daytime really looks good. Uh, so here we can really see one tenth of the data, it really has halluc hallucinates, but here it starts to, to work. So pr quite Two fascinating. Minutes. So some deep learning uh, applications, so we can uh, image reconstruction with subsampling, maybe reconstruction of ultra high resolution images, so uh, T1 mapping, or really go from uh, 3T data that looks like a 7T data, denoising, uh, construction image of a different contrast, image segmentation. Uh, another future application of deep learning could be that um, here, right now, the paradigm today is going from case space, reconstruction, image, and then we say this is a DEMA or not. But maybe we just go from case space directly to say, is there a DEMA or not? Uh, one important thing that you, when you talk about, with, about AI with radiologists is Will AI replace radiology? And then you go to Google and you see that someone else has already thought about that. So the answer to that, this question One is no. Um, the technology is not, not there uh, yet. Uh, and um, especially here, it comes in to, to, to the task again. It would take thousands of applications because the tasks that we have machine learning for is quite limited. Uh, and there's no certification system for this. Um, and physicians, they learn all, all, all their lives. Um, you could train machine learning to do that, but that will not FDA approve because this is not how the regulatory system works. Um, so, will AI change radiology? Yes, this is really certain. So it will help in routine repeated tasks and probably it will work like a second opinion to help the physician see, this, did I miss anything? Um, and maybe completing the final report automatically. Um, and um, yeah, so um, will AI change radiology system? This is also, I would say, really certain. Uh, so the transition from program-based data has really started. Um, and the key thing here is understanding medical questions. Uh, and. Basically, as a programmer, I, need, I will spend much more time cleaning big data sets than, than de developing algorithms that I did before. There will be new designs of uh, neural networks and new, new ways of training them. Just quickly, can AI possibly lead to wrong results? Here's an example of a, of a uh, car uh, where they put some stickers on the stop sign and then uh, the, the, it, it read stop, but now it reads speed limit 90, 45. So systems can be fooled. Um, here's an exa example that our systems may not learn as efficient as we, as we think. Here they train pigeons to do Gleason scoring. Um, and it turns out if a flock of uh, pigeons, they really perform really good. Uh, and they can be trained in a couple of days uh, with much less images. But most importantly, they are able to handle color differences that humans are not, or that today's AI systems are not able to handle. Uh, so they are not sensitive which hospitals the plates come from. Here are some relevant online talks that you uh, might want to, to, to spend your evening with. I think they are quite educational and quite interesting talks. So thanks for this. Thank you very, very much for this uh, com comprehensive talk, illuminating this complex concept of uh, machine learning and deep learning. Thank you very much. Ο χρόνος έχει περάσει και σε βόμενη την επόμενη συνεδρία. Δεν θα έχουμε χρόνο για ερωτήσεις. Σας παρακαλώ σε κάποιο διάλειμμα βρείτε κάποιον από τους ομιλητές αν έχετε κάποια ερώτηση να του κάνετε. Εγώ θέλω να εκφράσω ότι σε ευχαριστήσω στους φοιτητές για τις εξαιρετικές παρουσιάσεις τους. Στο προφέσο Χέλμπεργ για την δικιά του πολύ περιεχτική παρουσίαση. Είμαστε στην πολύ αρχή του να καταλάβουμε ποια είναι η Artificial Intelligence. Ακούστηκαν τα καλά πράγματα που μπορεί να, δώσουν, μπορεί να δώσει. Νομίζω δεν ακούστηκαν οι, οι ρεαλιστικοί φόβοι για το τι α, ζημιά που μπορεί να κάνει α, στο ανθρώπινο είδος εν γέννη. Αλλά αυτά νομίζω θα μπορέσει να συζητηθεί κάποια, κάποια άλλη φορά. Α, δώσω τον, α, τον λόγο στον, α, στον συμπέροδρό μου α, για να κλείσει τη συνεδρία.
Κλείνοντας να πούμε ότι είμαστε ακόμα στην πολύ αρχή για μια ακόμα φορά. Γιατί η τεχνητή νοημοσύνη έχει, όπως αναφέρθηκε και ο τελευταίος ομιλητής, μια μακρά ιστορία με την ανθρωπότητα και πολλές αποτυχίες. Και είναι η τέταρτη, ας το πούμε έτσι, φορά, ή να το πω δεκαετία, που εφαρμόζεται και θα προσπαθήσει να εφαρμοστεί με επιτυχία σε διάφορους τομείς, με την ιατρική να είναι ένας από τους προεξέχοντες τομείς. Και ελπίζουμε ότι θα φέρει αλλαγές που θα είναι θετικές και στη ζωή μας, αλλά και στην βελτίωση της ποιότητας παροχής υπηρεσιών, στην έρευνά μας και σε οτιδήποτε κάνουμε, όπως η εκπαίδευση. Ε, αυτό δεν είναι μονάχα μια ευχή, είναι ε, επειδή έχω μια μικρή ανασχόληση με το χώρο, ε, νομίζω πως είναι επιταγή για όλους μας ότι θα πρέπει να βγει αληθές αυτό, ε, διότι επενδύονται πάρα πολλά στο χώρο της τεχνητής νοημοσύνης από όλους όσους ασχολούνται στο χώρο, από τα κράτη θα αρχίσουν να επενδύονται και επομένως θα πάει ε, χαμένο όλο αυτό το στοίχημα αν είναι τελικά αποτυχημένο. Όπως και να έχει, θα κρατήσουμε τα θετικά αυτής της συνεδρίας με, την πολύ στοχευμένη, με, με τις πολύ ωραίες παρουσιάσεις και των φοιτητών αλλά και του ε, ομιλητή από το εξωτερικό ε, και να σας ευχαριστήσουμε για την υπομονή σας.